All right, good afternoon, everybody, or morning or evening, wherever you happen to be tuning in from. Um, thanks for the opportunity um, to All Things Open to be able to talk about some of the work we're doing at the National Security Agency. Really excited to be with you today uh, and talk through this. Um, and then uh, this probably will not, the talk won't take 45 minutes, so hopefully we'll have some time at the end for, for Q&A. And uh, we've got a few folks from the team on as well, so we can, we can answer things for you. All right, let's get started. Uh, so a little bit about me. I'm a senior executive technical leader at the agency. I've been at NSA for almost 15 years now, um, which I know is a really long time in tech, uh, but it's been a great place to be. I still enjoy working there. Uh, I've had the opportunity to kind of reinvent myself three or four times now in terms of the things I'm, I'm working on. So I started out uh, as an RF and computer engineer, uh, building systems, working on kind of software-defined radio um, efforts and frameworks and things like that, and uh, ended up building uh, something called the Red Hawk Software-Defined Radio Toolkit. With uh, uh, We started a whole program, and we ended up releasing it open source um, from the agency. So did kind of development, system building, all those things. And then as we released Red Hawk open source, really got into um, open source in general. And I've been doing it my whole career, but that really kind of catalyzed um, my passion for it. And so um, kind of been pushing that at the agency and a part of it my entire career. And I had the opportunity to be a technical director after that for a little while. Um, and then I was accepted into, we have a lot of development programs at the agency. So I was accepted into something called the senior technical development program, which is kind of like um, a technical PhD internally for uh techie folks inside the agency. It's not quite a PhD, but basically you get to devote, you, you put a proposal together for a board and you get to spend some time focused on learning something for several years. And so one of the things I asked to focus on when I got in that was open source and helping the agency to catalyze where we were going to go, how we were going to do it and, and our processes. The other thing was software development and developer advocacy. And so that led to something called DevX, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And then that's all evolved. Now I'm, I'm the organizational chief leading a lot of our unclassified IT efforts and trying to help the agency uh, move into a place to better uh, support telework and, un and our unclassified IT. And I'll talk about that a little bit as well. All right. So let's start with open source. Um, NSA has a rich history of open source software. We've been doing open source publicly for 20 years. We released SE Linux um, almost 20 years ago now and have just continued to release and be a part and contribute uh, ever since. And so uh, most recently, Ghidra, which many people heard about, those, that was a big release last year, uh, the reverse engineering toolkit. And that was a huge release for us. A lot of effort and time went into that one. And then uh, most recently, skill tree it was just released last week and so uh, terrence pew one of my colleagues has given a talk on that at this conference so I encourage you to tune into that it's really exciting and we're uh, we're very excited to see that release to the open source community so so why do we do it why does an intelligence agency for the u.s government care about open source what's the point well we use a lot of open source software um you know we're we're a tech we're part of the tech industry we hire lots of developers uh, lots of mathematicians, and um, we have a really kind of rich history around all that. And so we want to be able to contribute back to that. We want to be able to uh, give, give back to the community. And, um, you know, I just realized that one of my slides didn't make it over um, from a previous thing. That's all right. We'll keep moving. So um, we want to engage the open source community. We want to be part of it. We want to not just release things, but we want to contribute back as well. And there's proven results, right? I think there, there's no question now in the tech community how foundational open source is. And uh, I think the tech industry is just adopting it and making it core, a core part of the way we do business. All the big tech companies are doing this. And so I, I don't think that's up for debate anymore, um, but it's, it's really critical that the federal government and, and uh, NSA in particular is part of that um, community as well. And it's policy. In 2016, um, the federal government released, uh, the U.S. federal government released source code policy M1621, which encourages the use and con contribution back to 
open source software. So I'm going to take just a quick second and talk a little bit about um, NSA itself um, because we lost, I lost that slide somehow today. Sorry about that when I was transitioning things over. So for those of you not familiar, uh, National Security Agency is um, part of the intel US intelligence community. We've been around since 1952. We have two primary missions. We have a foreign signals intelligence mission, which is to penetrate sensitive uh, networks and communications for our adversaries with the goal to understand the plans and intentions and be able to give those insights to our US policymakers, um, military commanders, cyber defenders, and our allies, support military operations, that kind of thing. The other primary mission for the National Security Agency is cybersecurity to safeguard the national, um, national security systems and then protect and defend those and then provide general cybersecurity advice to US network uh, defenders and to our allies. And so that's kind of what we're about. Um, as an agency, and you can imagine with those two missions, we have a highly technical workforce. Um, we are the largest um, employer of mathematicians in the US, and um, we have um, a, over 40,000 affiliates, so we're a big company, uh, or in line with kind of big companies, a uh, very large tech workforce. And so open source really plays into that for us um, as, as kind of a key uh, driver for our technical success, and we want to be able to be part of that community. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges and the support inherent to being part of the federal government, but also wanting to contribute to open source. So there are some challenges. Um, copyright is one of those. So uh, federal employees are not afforded copyright protection under US law. Um, it's a little different when you start looking at overseas. Uh, and so that's a bit of a challenge because a lot of open source licensing is based on sort of the fundamental principle of copyright. The second thing is if you're in the intelligence community and you're working on classified things as part of your job, you have a, uh, we have an obligation for those things to be reviewed before we put them out in the public pre-publication if it has to do with your job. And so, you know, you can imagine somebody's working on some, some cool tech. We figured out a reasonable, sensible way to separate the things that are sensitive from the things that aren't sensitive. We still have to do an equity kind of process to make sure that that's reasonable. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But there is a lot of support. So I talked about the policy earlier from 2016. Um, we've got code.gov, 18F, USDS, and, and the Defense Digital Services, GSA, have all spent a ton of time on this, are still spending a ton, ton of time on this, uh, providing a lot of support, guidance, repositories for people to kind of document what they're doing, how they're doing it. And uh, it's really incredible kind of the support across the federal government. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about our approach specifically at NSA. So there is some, some cultural, uh, you know, things that are interesting as part of NSA, right? We are a part of the intelligence community. We, we can't talk about most of the things we work on. And so there is still some sort of questions that we answer um, and, and get in these interesting conversations where folks maybe aren't familiar with open source. They're like, hey, can we do that? Can we just release code out there? Is it is it secure? Is it more secure? Is it less secure? And thankfully, because of the federal source code policy, because of the precedent set across the federal government and um, just sort of the overwhelming understanding uh, across the tech sector, a lot of these questions are, are pretty straightforward to answer now, more so than they were 15 years ago um, when I first started kind of getting involved in open source at the agency. Um, I will say our processes have come a really, really long way. So uh, the first kind of open source effort I was involved in was, was Red Hawk, as I mentioned before. This was back in 2011. And we'll, by the time we decided that we wanted to open source it and kind of got general buy-in from our management, it took 18 months from sort of that decision to actually flipping the switch on GitHub to make that, that public release. And uh, that was incredible amount of hard work by a lot of people um, on, on my team and other folks from support from our legal and policy teams. Um, but that's really a long time to go. And so a group of folks over the years, uh, myself included, but I'm not the only one, have been working to say, how can we improve that process? So here's what it looks like uh, today. And again, we're continuing to improve this. There's kind of three main um, steps to this. There's the pre-release, release approval, and post-release. And we'll talk about that a bit. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, federal employees aren't afforded copyright protection under U.S. law. And so traditionally, these projects that we've released from the government have been public domain, but that doesn't jive very well with 
kind of the open source licenses and how people are normally uh, accustomed to contributing to projects and dealing with with various open source licenses. And so um, we have partnered with uh, Defense Digital Services and the Code.mil folks to kind of put together a draft approach. We're still kind of working to finalize some of these things. Uh, but generally speaking, we kind of start with, with this flow. And so it starts with the pre-release. Why are we doing it? Uh, what's the approach we're going to take? Is it going to go um, on GitHub? Are we going to be supporting it, right? We don't want to just put projects out there. Um, and then never touch them again, right? Because somebody just wanted to release their code, right? It's got to be a commitment um, to, to kind of be active. Now, now, some projects do fall off, right? And we don't, you know, every, I think every open source area and community has that where you don't always support things forever. But generally speaking, that's one of the questions we ask our teams is why are you doing this? What's your commitment? Are you going to be around and, and support this and be part of this? And then ultimately does management support that and buy off on it? And then we go through the release approval process. And you kind of see the flow chart on the right of all the types of questions we ask and the paperwork we go through here. And this is really important. It seems, it seems heavyweight, but for a large intelligence community agency, it's really critical that we are sensible and uh, well kind of intentioned. We have kind of clear intentions of, of releasing intellectual property like this. And so the idea here is, well, you know, it has to be unclassified, right? We can't be releasing sensitive things. Um, what sort of legal implications are there if we, we often work with industry partners through defense contractors on software? So we've got to make sure all the contract legal things are in place for intellectual property there. Um, and then kind of what are the pros or cons? Like, is this the right thing to do for the agency? And I think some of those decisions are very similar to what any large company would make. Is this the right thing to release? Is it good? Is it kind of good for the... the the sector in general and good for the community in general and is it something that we support um, at a large level and then finally we kind of get to the post release and um, this is um, yeah sorry this is um, I was making sure I was tracking the right things. This is where we talk about how to accept contributions, how we're going to communicate to the community. Remember, I talked about pre-publication before, and this is where we want to make sure that our teams understand how they're allowed to communicate uh, with the open source world, folding in all the constraints we have as being part of the federal government and part of the intelligence community, and then how we're going to accept those contributions. And so we're tentatively telling teams right now to kind of pick one of two ways, although this isn't, these aren't the only two ways for sure, and it's not the only two ways we do it either. But if teams don't know how they want to accept contributions, we say, hey, inbound outbound is really the easiest. It's, it's the default for most projects. It's, it's the default for GitHub if you put things on there and don't label it, which basically says uh, whatever license you put on the project, that's how you're going to accept contributions based on that license. And then we've got the DCO, the Developer Certificate of Origin, which has gained lots of popularity over the last few years. Uh, it's the Linux kernel community is where it came from, and um, Docker and uh, Android and OpenStack and a few others uh, use this to accept contributions or have historically. And so this is kind of the approach we're working through now. Um, we're still trying to finalize this and kind of to bake it in, but um, we've, we've seen a lot of success with our teams and our, and our current uh, skill tree uh, release this week um, went through this process as well. Uh, all right, let's talk about DevX a little bit. So the open source efforts have kind of been going on, as I said, for 20 years. And one of the things is we were really digging into this about four years ago and trying to figure out how to make the processes better and make it more accessible to developers across the agency, not just big teams that are well-funded, but, but an individual who just wants to contribute. We realized we needed a central developer nexus for the whole ecosystem. Open source was critical, but without the rest of kind of a common place for developers to go and ask questions and get support and have an advocacy group, it was tough to really have the platform to improve open source uh, by itself. And this is, this is how DevX was born. There was a group of us who got together and said, we really need a, a central team that's kind of focused on the developer experience. And uh, so that's what we did. And um, the kind of the big goals of that are to deliver world-class software developer tools. Um, we have amazing talent at the, at the National Security Agency, and there was lots of um, tools and, and flows and development practices um, all over the place that were fantastic. The challenge is if you were a new team, didn't have a lot of funding, uh, you maybe didn't know where to go and, and who was going to support that and who was going to make sure the latest tech was coming in and who could you call if you had an issue. And uh, there wasn't really that place before. 
and now there is. We also wanted a place that could advocate for developers' needs, that could promote uh, best practices like DevOps, and then elevate the security practices through all parts of the development lifecycle. And so that's what DevX is. So there's, there's kind of five main uh, pillars in DevX. Um, brief summary of that our, our main goal here was to increase the throughput and velocity velocity and quality of production software delivery to NSA. It's a pretty generic goal, but we are passionate about that and it really motivates how we do business uh, in the DevX arena. So from a productivity space, this is kind of our Atlassian product suite, um, digital Kanban boards, uh, really trying to provide those tools that allow developers to, to track things, have the workflows they need and the visibility they need to get their, their work done. We have a security team that's focused on things like supply chain, code security, cloud security, um, and, and really elevating that and, and kind of providing common best practices for all of those things and um, really making that better every single day. Our ecosystem team, which is where the skill tree uh, program lives, is focused on all those things that are, are critical to making the lives day-to-day -day better for developers at the agency. Um, we live, most of our folks live on an air-gapped network, a, a network that's not connected to the internet. And so there's some challenges presented in that space, right? We can't just go out through federal, because of federal regulations, security regulations, and then some of the regulations we have at the NSA, we can't just go out and use internet services to track things. and. Um, kind of look at various aspects of the job, like we, like maybe a small startup company could. And so this team is really dedicated on providing a rich ecosystem uh, inside for NSA developers. And it's really critical. So there's a program called DevHub, which is sort of a central place for all things documentation related and guidance related for software development. That's where our open source program lives. And then you'll, you'll hear more about Skilltree, which is a micro learning gamification platform. Uh, we have a community team that's focused on outreach to our IC partners, our intelligence community partners uh, across DOD and the IC and providing kind of common tools and services um, across those uh, agencies where it makes sense and, and kind of building those partnerships. And then we have our pipeline team. And this is where our, a lot of our GitLab and DevOps uh, work happens. And I'll talk a little bit about there. And DevOps is just critical to how we do business. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it is kind of a buzzword and can be a buzzword, but for us, it, it means more than that, right? We really want to get development teams and production teams to think about things like lead time, deployment frequency, mean time to restore, change failure percentage, measurable, quantifiable values to track progress towards reliability over time. So to that end, this is one of the teams, we worked with the chief architects at NSA to build in some DevOps best practice metrics and measurements um, and practices to our program reviews that can get applied to every program at the agency. And so it gives us the opportunity to ask those questions as programs come through that. And so we're really committed to that uh, from a DevX perspective and trying to help the agency under folks who don't understand it and folks who do uh, have a place to go to get the resources they need. Um, all right, so I will talk a little bit about GitHub, I mean GitLab. Um, so, uh, one of our, the, our lead for this program, Eric Mosher gave a, a presentation recently at one of the GitLab conferences, but I'll just kind of give a quick summary here to, to kind of summarize what DevX is all about. Um, and this is kind of how we went from scaling, uh, to a very small effort to a very large, well-supported effort for our, uh, DevOps pipeline at the agency. And so we kind of started, uh, we have, I mentioned before, we have a, a very kind of rigorous security environment and a lot of federal guidelines that we have to abide by. It's really important because of the work we do to really kind of make sure we're doing that right. But that can be challenging because we do have um, an air-gapped environment. We aren't connected to the internet, and we, but we still need our developers to have the, the latest and greatest capabilities. Um, security is our middle name, so we have to, we have to be very careful about this stuff. Um, so in the early days, we had several GitLab kind of projects floating around, volunteer-led, big or kind of big monolithic instances that were really customized heavily to fit into our environments. And so they kind of got bogged down. They weren't as performant as we wanted to. And it was really easy to get out of date because we'd heavily modified the source code, which as we all know, if you're, if you're heavily modifying the source code, it's not getting back up into the mainline um, uh, branches and trunk, then it can present a lot of challenges. And so we really wanted to provide the best experience here possible in a secure way uh, and reduce the numbers, uh, the number of instances there. And so um, 
what we did is uh, we had the opportunity, NSA does a lot of public-private partnerships with a lot of industry partners. And so um, we worked with GitLab uh, Inc. public sector and some AWS solutions architects to design a cloud native version that worked on our top secret instance of AWS. And uh, we wanted it to be high availability, incredibly performant and really work um, uh, the like people would expect on the internet, right? And so we went away kind of from the volunteer led and monolithic instance there to uh, a funded uh, team. We, we created a two pizza team that went, that kind of came together to work with our industry partners. And we practiced the deployment, we practiced the transition, we built um, kind of a core model where we plugged in our security in modular ways as opposed to kind of modifying the core source code heavily so we could keep up and be more agile with the deployments and the new security features that are coming out. And then we were able to deploy uh, GitLab onto our internal uh, AWS cloud with success. So we use CloudFormation, SaltStack. We actually used a GitLab ops instance to deploy GitLab. So we kind of really bought into the infrastructure's code model and practice that over and over and over again, the migration of years and years and years of intellectual property. We wanted to get that right and developers need that service every day. And so uh, it took a couple months to really kind of plan all that out, get all the practice done, but it was very successful. And now our developers are really happy. Uh, we serve thousands and thousands of developers every month and uh, it is a much more performant uh, usable system than it was uh, previously. And so it's, it's really exciting to kind of see the principles that were built up in DevEx of DevOps and infrastructure's code and kind of all the things we've learned over the years uh, applied into something like GitLab. If you want to know more about that, I would definitely encourage you to check out Eric's talk. Um, he went into a lot more detail uh, about the, the tech behind it. Okay, so last thing is uh, here I want to talk about a little bit is telework at NSA. So I know this is a big topic across the world right now with COVID, right? It's how agencies are figuring this out, how companies are figuring this out, whole industries are figuring this out. And so one of the fundamental questions I think people have now is can an intelligence, can an intelligence agency figure this out? Is this something we can support and do? Uh, the short answer is yes, and we're working on it. Historically, though, telework it was not that prevalent at NSA, right? Most of our work was done on the top secret network. Um, most of our folks were able to just go to work every day and do that work. And it, there just wasn't a big need for it. Some folks teleworked here and there, but it just wasn't something that we pursued and, and didn't necessarily um, need to go after. Um, our work has evolved over the last five or 10 years though. With software development, our engagement with cyber, on the cybersecurity front with industry partners, academia, government, there's a lot of more need to be on the internet and collaborating on the internet than maybe there was 10 or 15 years ago. A lot of the work we do requires and thrives on that collaboration. So there was already these conversations happening over the last five years, 10 years of supporting more unclassified internet facing work. Um, to that end, we'd actually already built about four years ago, something we call a protected low side development environment. It's on commercial cloud services. We wrapped a lot of security around it. And some of our developers had been leveraging that uh, primarily from our office space though, to do this unclassified, we call it low side work versus high side, which is the top secret network. Um, and, and we've been doing that for a while. And one of the big kind of revelations there was, um, when COVID hit and we were kind of driven to this posture of trying to, to, to support social distancing and things like that was, wow, we built that so securely uh, that um, we could probably let our folks use that from home and that there's no additional risk there. And so that's what we've been doing uh, from a software development perspective, which has worked really, really well. Some of the other things we're pursuing right now is um, standing up and embracing Microsoft Office 365 for, for, for collaboration, um, for for kind of virtual meetings and documents and things like that. I talked about our protected low side development environment. We're also building out a variation of that uh, to allow for even more collaboration with folks who don't have clearances, right? So we can do technical work with folks from academia and other government agencies um, and industry partners. And so um, we're really just trying to figure out how to scale these things even more. And we're investing a lot of time and energy into this. Um, we've put a lot of work into it over the last eight months in particular, um, as COVID-19 has really forced that conversation and that look. 
The great news is we were already on a path to do that. And all the solutions we're putting in place today, they're here to stay. We're not standing up temporary things that are going to go away, um, you know, next year or the year after. These are things that our agency was already on the path to do. We've accelerated some to meet the, meet the need and meet the demand uh, from a telework perspective. And so we're really now focused on what are the processes, procedures, and guidelines we need to put in place to make this a sustained approach that we can look at year over year and how to do it. And so there's, there's kind of three main questions we ask when it comes to this space. Can and should this work be done in a sensible way in the unclass environment, right? That's, that's first and foremost, right? Um, we have to start there. We can't move all of our work down to um, the unclassified side. Some of our work is very sensitive and needs to stay protected for national security reasons, and that's okay. But the things that, that can be moved down, let's take a hard look at those, and there's a, there's a cross kind of a full, full cross directorate um, across the whole agency team looking at that right now. And okay, then the next question is what IT is needed to support that, right? If it's a software development thing, can we use our protected uh, software development environment? If it's for virtual meetings, can we use something like Microsoft Teams? And how do we, how do we map that to it? And if it's something new, can we stand up a new program? And is that merited? And is there support for that? And things like that. And then the last thing is kind of the fundamental question uh, that I think is true everywhere is does the employee have the proper training and all the approvals to go go ahead and move into the telework environment. And so uh, it's been a really incredible um, effort over the last eight months. A lot of people put a lot of work into it, uh, but the good news is it's building on a foundation that was already in place before and is gonna continue uh, hopefully long after uh, the current pandemic subsides. So that's where we're at today. Um, okay, so that's all I had kind of for, for the prepared slides. Happy to take some, some Q&A now and really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about our open source uh, DevOps and, and telework efforts going on at the agency right now. All right, I'm going to flip over. I think we've got some questions coming in um, as well. Um, okay, here's one. Um, when you decide whether some code will be publicly released before you start so you can tailor it properly or once it's complete so it's proven useful. So when do you decide that question? Um, so the answer to that is, is a bit of both, to be honest. There are some times where we have projects that have been built for a very specific use case um, inside the NSA. And we realized later that there's nothing sensitive about them and it would be a really useful tool for the outside uh, world. Um, but as the prevalence of open source and kind of our internal developer evangelism and advocacy has gone on, particularly the DevEx team, uh, I think people are starting to think about that more and we're encouraging people now to say, hey, if, if the thing you're going to go build, you know, up front doesn't have anything sensitive in it and it'd be useful to the community, why don't you go ahead and start thinking about that from day one? Uh, go ahead and be careful with the intellectual property decisions you make, be careful with the, uh, the way you architect that solution and think about open source from day one. And I would say skill tree is more that, uh, more the latter than the former. Um, it was started out as a specific way to help train a particular uh, tool that we had inside. Um, but I think very quickly that team realized, wow, this could be a powerful tool that the rest of the open source community would really like. And so they kind of baked that into their mindset from then on. So. Um, okay, which chat application do you use? Um, so I mentioned this a little bit, I think, um, at the end there. So we are um, heavily invested in Microsoft Office 365, um, actually on all our networks. And so um, when we talk about sort of the telework environment, Microsoft Teams is what we're using there. But we're also that the agency is working an effort um, to bring that capability to our um, internal networks as well. Um, for the IC. So that's that's kind of our primary uh, method there. Um, okay, let's see. All right, for your telework initiative, um, this talks about the how do we connect into the infrastructure and how do you allow ex external connections? That really depends on the environment which we're talking about. And so um, I can't get into too many details there about the architecture and the design, uh, but generally speaking, we are leveraging cloud services, commercial cloud services, and we're also leveraging some internal kind of on-premise capabilities as well. And so it really just depends on the environment and how we're approaching the problem, uh, what the right tech is to use. 
Um, when you say DevX, it, that is the term meaning developer experience and not DevX.com. I haven't heard of DevX.com. I should probably know that. But yes, it's an internal term we were using to describe developer experience at NSA. All right. Let me click these done. Um, okay, so we have a question here about um, NSA is doing these great initiatives. Do you think it will become a trend in the intelligence community with telework and DevX or just specific to NSA? Um, it's hard to say, you know, I don't want to speak. Um, I don't want to speculate on that. I will, I will talk a little bit about what we've seen in the DevX front. So every year, DevX sponsors an IC wide um, kind of developer conference internal to the intelligence community and it's really widely attended and really popular and so you know i can say that kind of the trends of adopting devops practices adopting modern software development practices adopting sort of the the cid cd models the um, infrastructures code it is just as highly embraced inside the federal government technical agencies as it is in the outside kind of tech industry. Now, we may have some different regulations and different security constraints that have, have made some of those go faster, slower. That just really depends on the agency and the project. But, you know, our folks are kind of going to all the same conferences, reading all the same books, learning all the same things that a lot of the tech industry is, and are really trying to adopt that and scale and build out our expertise as well. Um, okay, got that one. Um, okay, so this question, do we maintain separate code bases or branches of public release projects specific to NSA's uses of the project? Um, like, do we maintain a generic or in specific versions of the project? Um, that just depends. I think most of that comes down to the architecture. What we really try to encourage teams to do is um, build their projects in a modular way. So um, they're fun to, there usually is gonna be a sensitive application to some of the things we build, not always. Um, and so when there is that separation, it, we encourage folks, instead of trying to maintain separate branches or ma maintain different uh, baselines, to really focus on modularity. So add in, in a modular way, the things that they need to be able to do the specific mission we need done um, and not, you know, not trying to create a more complex uh, configuration management problem. So that's just kind of general principles, but the actual specifics are, are really um, down to each project and, and what sort of architecture they have and what decisions they've made. Um, has adopting telework limited restricted hiring in the IC? Um, I don't quite understand that question, but I will say to this, um, one of the big things we're trying to do as part of our initiatives with, um, with telework and all these things is allow our recruiters and our hiring folks the flexibility to really um, be able to do their job in this really kind of heavily virtual world, right? A year ago, most recruiting events um, that we seem to be a part of were physical, right? You went to a campus, you went to a recruiting fair, you, you did um, these other things. And um, now it's all shifted to virtual. And so one of the big pushes from an IT perspective that we're really trying to support our hiring and recruiting folks is to be able to adapt and be in that world and be really successful uh, and do that. Uh, okay. It seems like there's a lot of specialized security related knowledge needed to work at NSA. Do people tend to come in with that knowledge or do they learn as they go? That's a really great question. Um, it's probably both. Um, depending on where the person comes from. So a lot of our security um, kind of knowledge and, and the, the guidelines we have to follow are federal. Um, we have to follow all the NIST guidelines. And so we kind of talk about NIST 853, a lot of federal agencies, most federal agencies have to um, abide by all those guidelines. So there's a, there's a chance of kind of been working with the federal government, you may have been exposed to some of these things before. Uh, but then in addition to that, we have another set of security related things that we are very focused on uh, when it comes to particularly deploying IT and securing that IT uh, inside NSA. And, and so those are things that in some cases you have to learn kind of as you go. Um, applying obviously 
the security knowledge that you may have gained in other experience or in education and things like that as well. Um, but we do take it very, very seriously and spend a lot of time and energy on it for, uh, I think for very good reasons. Okay. What do you consider top secret versus public in a code sense? That's a good question. Um, that's part of the question we ask our developers and our managers to ask on a regular, to ask themselves on a regular basis, right? What's sensitive about what you're doing? What's not? Um, when it comes into the different classifications, there's all sorts of guidelines um, across across the federal government about those classification levels. So I'm not going to get into that here, and it's very specific to the topic. But generally, when it comes to software, I think probably more the fundamental question is, you know, is there any anything sensitive about the effort that um, that shouldn't be that would that would compromise uh, anything from our mission, right? That's the real question. And uh, and a lot of times with software, particularly when we talk about frameworks and things like that, it's the data and how it's used that's sensitive versus the actual software itself. And so that's what we're finding in a lot of cases. It's like oh, like Skill Tree or some of these other things that we're working on that can totally be released. Um, we might use it on a system on the inside that's sensitive, but the actual software itself is okay to release. And so that's that's kind of an ongoing conversation per per project. Okay, got that one, that one. Um, okay, this is a great question. I love this question. Is OSS participation um, being seen as a recruitment retention tool? If not, what does NSA get out of participating in open source? Um, I would say primarily that's not our goal, but it is a side benefit of it. So let me explain. Um, I think our primary goal with open source is that community aspect that we, we hire tons and tons of really smart people who come out of school, come from other jobs and industries where they've participated in open source, right? And they really enjoy it. They're passionate about it. And we are contributing and building great things too that we believe and our folks believe and want to give back to the open source community. And particularly as uh, civil servants, um, I think there there's even more to be said personally. That's my personal view that we could, uh, that it's a, it's a great opportunity to give back, you know, our, our salaries are, are paid for by taxpayer dollars. Um, and so I think that's, that's part of it. But then also it kind of being part of the open source community, making open source and software better has been proven to create more secure software, better software, right? Like a lot of the software that's underpending under, underpinning things that are major shifts that are happening right now is open source. And I don't think that's any different than, than kind of how we want to be a part of that. And so um, I think a, a side benefit is that it does give us a platform to talk about some of the technical work we're doing. And from a recruiting perspective to say, hey, if you're interested in some of the types of technical work that you could be doing, check out code.nsa.gov and you'll see Ghidra, you'll see Skilltree, you'll see Red Hawk and things like that. Um, and so there, it is a nice part for, for recruiting and hiring, but I don't think that's the main goal. Um, I would, I would, uh, here's another question. I would think that releasing certain types of software would also be qualifies revealing capability. I assume that would be case where software couldn't be released as open source. Uh, yep. That's, that's part of the, the review process is, uh, what's it reveal? What does it not reveal? Is this a sensible thing to do or not? Um, what are the pros and cons? And, and to be honest, from talking to other industry partners and other government agencies, I think that math is not all that different from what other folks do in other companies. The, the difference of sensitivity, the, how you rate sensitivity might be different. You know, we might look at it from a classification scale, uh, whereas a, a company might look at it at, from a proprietary or intellectual property perspective. Um, but the, the calculus is, is similar, I think, in some ways, or at least analogous. Okay, I don't see, oh, we did get another one come in. Um, all right, we've got a question coming in. What would be the most important soft skill for a new NSA technologist to have? That is a great, um, that's a great question. Um, I Just speaking for me personally, I think this is, it's probably true of almost any company or any industry from a technologist. And that's curiosity and a, and a willingness to learn, 
both from a um, technical perspective, but also from a um, kind of professional perspective, right? What are, the, what are the technical skills I need to hone, but what are those other skills I need to hone in terms of being able to work on teams, uh, work in a large organization, understand priority, uh, be able to communicate well. And so I think the, that kind of intrinsic curiosity and desire to grow and, and become better at whatever you're working on, I think is, is just really critical. Um, and one of the things that we, at least my team, we work to, to challenge each other on every day.